Apple has now released a MacBook Pro, a MacBook Air, a Mac Mini and an iMac, all with Apple Silicon, but we know there's a lot more still to come, so when are we getting it? This video is supported by NordPass, letting you store all of your passwords in one place. Organize your logins and private notes in a secure password vault and access it all with a single master password. And with NordPass's data breach scanner, you can find out if your online account or credit card information has been leaked. Right now, NordPass has their spring forward sale too until June the 1st, 2021. So my audience can get 70% off NordPass at nordpass.com forward slash iCave or use the code iCave plus, you'll get an additional month of NordPass for free. Thank you to NordPass for sponsoring this video. I'm Ico Dave and in this video we are discussing what is coming next from Apple Silicon. We did a whole video months back on my guess of what we would get from Apple Silicon. Some of it's come true, some of it hasn't, but we're going to talk about what's still to come from Apple and when I think we're going to get it. Plus some of those cool colours that we've been talking about for a while with Apple Silicon. So what do we already have in place with Apple Silicon right now? So back in November, Apple released the MacBook Pro 13 inch with touch bar, the MacBook Air 13 inch with not touch bar, and the Mac mini with not keyboard or screens. I don't think anyone was expecting quite that many Macs to come out right at the beginning. As far as everyone was thinking at the time, we were expecting to get one Mac probably, a lightweight, thin and light MacBook of some sort, we didn't know if it was going to be an Air or a Pro or just a MacBook, the old 12 inch style. I don't think anyone was predicting that we would get three different Macs at the first event. I thought we would get a laptop and probably the Mac Mini, but to get the Pro and the Air and the Mac Mini all with the same silicon inside, they all kind of have the same performance, except that the Air has no internal fan, so it kind of ramps down a little bit more quickly. I don't think anyone was expecting that. Fast forward to April this year, and we had the iMac 24 inch, also announced with Apple Silicon inside, and still with that same M1 processor. But the iMac has got an active cooling system, quite a substantial one in fact, with dual fans. I think it's the first Apple Silicon that has dual fans inside. It looks very much like that has got a lot more thermal headroom to it than the three that we'd had before. A lot of people are concerned about why it has to have this chin. The chin is actually where all of the computer is housed along with the speakers and everything else. Behind the display is basically just display. And I think the reason we've got that 11.5 millimeter chassis uh, with nothing else behind it is because Apple has already designed it ready to take the mini LED display panels that we've been been hearing about already. If you look at the iPad Pros, they've had to make them slightly thicker in order to accommodate these uh, panels, and I think they also dissipate quite a lot more heat than a traditional LCD, so that's part of the reason that the display portion is just display, and the computer portion at the bottom is basically just computer, because they don't want the heat from the display spilling over into the computer and saturating the processors, which would decrease performance fairly substantially. With that dual fan system, it looks like it is very much ready to take the M1X processor as and when that appears. Now remember that the M1 is about a 15 watt chip and the M1X is likely to be between 35 and 45 watts, so there's a lot more heat to dissipate. You would not be able to put that into the chassis of something like a MacBook Air, which is fanless, but the Mac Mini would be perfectly ready for, uh, to take that. The iMac 24 inch would be absolutely uh, capable of running that. And we are also expecting coming down the line our 14 inch and 16 inch MacBook Pro models, as well as the larger iMac. So it looks like the iMac could be coming with a 31 and a half inch display. We've been talking about 30 to 32 inches in the past, but I've seen some whisperings that 31 and a half is the number that they're going with. So we will see if that pans out. But regardless of that, we're going to get a larger screened iMac. I believe it's going to be at WWDC, along with the rest of the M1X lineup, which may include a higher spec iMac 24 inch, the 14 inch and 16 inch MacBook Pros, which we've been waiting to see the redesign on for some time. And also, I think we're going to be getting a Mac Mini with that in too. Now, the M1X, as we've talked about in the past, takes the M1, which is 4 and 4 efficiency and powerful processors and ramps up the performance processors to eight, which gives you a 12 core chip along with a 16 core GPU. Performance wise, that's gonna be somewhere around 14,000 on Geekbench, which is pretty, uh, pretty awesome. 
and about as quick I think we found as the 18 core Mac Pro that we have right now. So I'm expecting these to be announced at WWDC and shipping probably in the first half of July. Then what else do we have gaps in our lineup for? It looks like the Mac Pro is the other big thing that we're waiting for and Max Tech put out a video recently saying that they are expecting another Intel Mac Pro. Now, I don't see why Apple would do that from a few different angles. The first one being from a marketing point of view, Apple is releasing all of their own silicon. It makes no sense for them whatsoever to release another Intel Mac and say, we can't make a Mac that performs this well with our own silicon, so we're having to use Intel still. That makes absolutely no sense. So I think that the uh, drivers that we've seen for the Navi graphics cards, which is the only thing really that we've had pointing to the fact that there might be another Mac Pro, are actually just being put there ready so that it can be offered as an option, possibly in the existing Mac Pro, if they're even gonna upgrade that as a spec on the site, or they might just be adding the support for it for people that want to install their own graphics cards. I think it would be a bad thing if Apple didn't keep supporting the Mac Pros that they've put out there as they go up to like $50,000 in terms of configurations, but at the same time that doesn't mean they need to release more models because releasing new models doesn't mean that they're supporting the people that have already bought one. All it means is they need to include drivers so that the people that have bought one and need to add more current graphics options or other hardware that they can add to their existing box are able to do that. Just because they've only released one system in a box that looks like this doesn't mean they would be abandoning support for it if they didn't release more. So what do you guys think? I'm I'm really still kind of convinced that there isn't going to be another Mac Pro with Intel, but I do think we are going to see our Mac Pro with Apple Silicon at WWDC, and that's going to be the one that they look to release in December next year. And then I think they will discontinue the rest of the Intel line. I think the only Intel Mac that's still going to be on sale until uh, December is probably going to be that Mac Pro. Apple were talking about a two year transition period. I think that means that next year's WWDC is possibly the last version that will support Intel uh, and everything else after that will be security updates for the existing operating systems. That is my interpretation of what Apple means by a two year transition period. But let me know down in the comments, would you be absolutely furious if Apple doesn't release operating systems with new names for Intel Macs going forward, even though they're not selling Intel Macs anymore, because when we look back at the PowerPC transition, the first version that offered Rosetta was Tiger, then it was uh, Leopard and Snow Leopard were the last two that uh, included support for PowerPC software, so that could be our Rosetta roadmap too. I almost think though that this year when we get to WWDC, Apple will put a mark in the ground and say, if you are putting anything into the App Store from now on, it needs to have a universal binary so that Apple Silicon is supported natively. So just to be clear on the roadmap that I see going forward, I think at WWDC now, we will be seeing our 16 inch MacBook Pro, our 14 inch MacBook Pro, both with the X processors, um, shipping probably in July. We'll see the larger iMac again shipping between June and July. Uh, that will also come with the M1X inside, and I think the M1X will be offered as an option on the current 24-inch iMac. I also think we'll see a Mac Mini with the M1X inside, again, shipping probably quicker than the others so that people can see the performance, and then Apple gets another cycle of uh, news coverage as soon as that happens. Now, you might be thinking, what about the chip shortages? Now, the chip shortages are not on the five nanometer process that Apple uses for their M-series chips or their M1X chips. The chip shortages that are happening in the industry right now are for like 90 nanometer plus processors for the other chips that go on a board for, um, for logic controllers, for things like that. So there are constraints, but it's not for the main processors that go into Apple's stuff. So we shouldn't have any problems with this year's iPhones going forward. The only things might be looking more at legacy lines. So Intel products might be seeing more limitations with their chips, which might push Apple to roll out these Apple Silicon lines a little bit quicker. So as well as the June to July release schedule that I've just mentioned, Mac Pro, I think coming in December, but announced at WWDC in June as well. And then when we get to October, we will have our M2 rollout. I think we will see the M2 in October go into the iMac, basically everything that Apple does with an M1 right now. So the Mac Mini with M2, the MacBook Air with M2, 
but I don't think the, the MacBook Pro 13 inch with, uh, with M1 will be updated to M2. I think if anything, that's when it will be discontinued uh, or just kept as an M1 option at a lower price point with the M2 going into the 14 inch chassis at that point. So immediately, if you want that uh, 14 inch MacBook Pro chassis, you're gonna need to buy it with an M1X inside, which gives Apple a nice time to recoup the investment in the retooling and everything. Then come November time, the M2 will go into that 14 inch chassis at the lower price point, possibly starting at 1400 instead of $1,300 because it may well have that uh, mini LED display inside. And then MacBook Air will get its redesign towards the end of the year, maybe early next year. There's a possibility that they might push that a little bit later, but I think November would make sense because it gives them a big story to talk about with Apple Silicon and the Mac side of things too. Okay, edit time Dave here, just in a uh, disembodied voice form, but can we just take a moment to appreciate how awesome these renders are from Apple tomorrow? Um, he has got more colours coming. Apparently, they're going to be ready for tomorrow. Fingers crossed, because I want to share more with you. But uh, just go and follow the dude on Twitter, because they're awesome. Thanks. Obviously, with the MacBook Air, everyone's been talking about it recently. The colours are coming to MacBook Air that we've seen in the MacBook... Uh, the colors are coming to the MacBook Air that we've seen in the iMac range, which is awesome. And I don't know if I've mentioned this before, but I did predict that we would be getting colorful Macs to differentiate the Apple Silicon stuff in August last year, well before we'd seen any Apple Silicon stuff. I will link to the video up here. It is pretty terrible. Uh, I'll actually try and link to the right part of the video, but I don't know if I can. But I even predicted the right colors. And it wasn't based on leaks. It was purely what I expected color-wise. But I also think that this cadence will go forward. So I think we will get a, mid, a middle of the year X refresh on the processors. That's when you'll get your powerful stuff. And then at the end of the year, around the same time as the iPhones, because that's when the cores are updated. So that's where you get your power from. The Mac Pros, I kind of think we're gonna see multiple M series processors, possibly two M1X processors running in parallel, like they used to do with the G5s. That just seems like the easiest way, as long as they can get those processors to communicate with each other well enough. Uh, that seems like the most efficient way for them to make the chips in the kind of bulk that they need to make. Next up, Apple Hi-Fi is coming. We talked about Apple Hi-Fi earlier last week. We have had some more information. This comes from Maguire Wood on Twitter, Jiroku, which I've probably said wrong. But Apple Music Hi-Fi will come at no extra cost to Apple One subscribers, according to Maguire Wood. Still no solid word on the potential price increases to standard Apple Music subscribers. So it looks like if you are an Apple One member, you might get all of this uh, kind of lossless version included in your program, but there may be a surcharge if you only subscribe to Apple Music itself. Interesting. Um, I would think that Apple will want to throw it all into the same pot. So if you've got Apple Music, I think they will probably include it because then it will also differentiate them from uh, Spotify, who are going to be charging extra for this, and Tidal, which is a more expensive um, service that also charges more, I believe. Apple Music Hi-Fi will be optional for users in a standard settings menu for Apple Music. Apple will allow you to enable it for all songs if they can find a higher quality version of it. So basically, if you want to keep your streaming data low, you can use the regular versions. If you want to ignore the amount of data you're using, you can use this uncompressed or at least lossless version. I would guess it's still compressed somehow but uh, without removing any data. And Apple will work to convert standard high resolution audio files to ALAC, which is their lossless codec, Apple lossless audio codec, for files for use with Apple Music. Apple will gain support for high resolution ALAC files. Users who import their own ALAC files will have the option to choose audio bit rates. Now, the standard AirPods will not receive support for high resolution audio of this size through Bluetooth, although Maguire has been told that the AirPods Pro and AirPods Max will possibly be getting firmware updates to enable ALAC playback at full quality. To me, this makes total sense. It will give the AirPods Pro a real kind of defining feature again if the spatial audio is coming to the regular AirPods when AirPods 3 are launched. But he's also saying that these are not going to be coming at WWDC. They will be later in the year, um, which kind of makes sense. Although we've seen so many leaks that it kind of seems unlikely as well that this many of them have leaked out when they're not in major production. Although it might just be that because they are expecting to sell so many of these sort of 70, 80 million pairs, I would guess in the first year, 
that they've just had to start super early. My thought is that Apple Music for Lossless will be sending the full file over to the AirPods and then they will be decoded on the AirPod themselves. So there's still no real clarity on whether this is going to be released before or during WWDC. I would be surprised if it's at WWDC purely because WWDC is pretty much purely aimed at developers and very much to professional users. I don't know if a music service upgrade is the sort of thing that WWDC would bring unless they are opening up the technology behind it to developers as well. And this is kind of an announcement so that developers can use this lossless format in apps that they're developing, whether it's a music app or whether they're gonna bring this kind of lossless uh, technology to game audio or something like that. Maybe you'll be able to play games that use spatial audio and lossless sound. So you get this kind of immersive, like beautiful sound for your games. I don't know where they're going with it, if that's what they wanna do, but this is what we're hearing. So. Um, head over if you don't already follow Maguire on Twitter. Go and do that right now. Uh, the stuff he puts out is awesome. And thanks so much for this information that he's put out on Twitter. But I just thought I would share it with you guys to make sure that you are up to date with everything we know. And we only got one iCave answer today. If you've got a question that you want me to answer, all you need to do, use hashtag iCave answers down in the comments with any Apple question. I will answer it on the show for you. Sergio Santiago Jimenez, hi iCave answers. What do you think is the probability for Apple implementing the USB-A ports back into the next generation MacBook Pros? Keep up the great work. So I've got to be honest with you, man, I don't think it's going to happen. And the reason why I don't think this is going to happen is we've seen kind of the designs. We know exactly what these things are going to look like. We know exactly what ports are on there. So it looks like we're going to have three USB type C's. The only thing we don't know is what's going to be behind there. Are they all going to be Thunderbolt or is one of them going to be regular USB 4? I guess, but it seems weird that they would do that. Then we're going to have the HDMI port, we're going to have an SD card reader, full size SD card reader, and that MagSafe adapter. Um, I think there's also a headphone port in there, but I don't remember seeing that actually on the designs. I've I'm assuming they're not removing that one though. But no, I don't think they're gonna put USB-A back in. It is a legacy port at this point, and I know everyone's got a, uh, everyone's got stuff that uses it, and I'm sorry, but uh, all you need to do is buy the cable that goes from USB-C to your device instead of a USB-A one. It's a very small upgrade. They're about two to three dollars. It's not a big purchase. Very few USB-A devices have a hardwired connection. There's not a lot of them out there. Most of them are using a very generic cable and everyone complains that they need dongles to attach their stuff. No, they don't. They need to update their cables and then you're done. You use a single cable that goes from USB-C to whatever device it is and it makes far more sense. I don't know why everyone's complaining about dongles but also the reason that USB-A isn't going to come back is because it's such a thick port that although it will physically fit in the side of the laptop uh, most likely we don't know how thick these are going to be but it looks like they would be just about as thick as a USB-A port that leaves very little material either side of it and there have been images that we've seen in the past of uh, MacBooks that have bent at the ports because obviously the more material you take away the uh, less strength you have left in it and where we've had bend gate and things like that in the past with uh, iPads and the iPhone 6 Apple doesn't want to leave weak points in their products as much as possible because they don't want the bad publicity they don't want to have to repair as much stuff for a, for a company making a durable product is much more sensible than making a weak product that they have to fix you know it's not to encourage people to replace the products by making them weak it's that the company themselves don't want to have to spend the resources to repair these things so no i don't think usb a is coming back it doesn't look like it will it doesn't make sense that it would because it is just a less capable version of USB-C that happens to fit some old wires. How controversial is this guys? Um, sorry if I'm upsetting people with my USB uh, snobbery, but just get with the program. <laughs> Thanks so much for watching and I'll see you in the next one.